How did a single congregation grow to become one of the largest and most influential churches in America only to experience a cataclysmic decline that placed its very existence in doubt? How did that same church endure a brutal and painful season of change to emerge from the transition stronger, more united, and more committed than ever to Jesus' Great Commission? I want to tell you this story. This is a story about the way ministry is changing in a new and harsher world, painfully different than the one known by our parents and grandparents. It's a story for pastors who face the daunting task of leading their churches through necessary but excruciating seasons of transition so they can move from surviving to thriving. This is a story for people who are part of those churches and experiencing the profound loss, the painful heartbreak, and the intense frustration that always comes with change. This is the story of what happened at First Baptist, the rise, ruin, and restoration of one of America's great churches. And ladies and gentlemen, Jacksonville is divided. Jacksonville is divided between those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus and those who today love the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Lord and between those who have rejected him or ignored him or live as if he did not exist. But when I get to heaven, I want to go and look in the face of Jesus. And I'm going to say, Jesus, thank you so much for saving a little nine-year-old boy like me in North Georgia. And thank you for calling me to preach as a 16-year-old boy. I never dreamed. I never dreamed what you had in store for me. It's been glorious. It's been glorious. That's exactly what God does when you are willing to let him chisel and hammer and shape and work on your life. He will produce in time what you never thought you could ever be. To his glory. To his glory. One of the hallmarks of American Christianity is the dotting across the American religious landscape of churches that bear the name First Baptist. Almost every town, certainly in the South, has a First Baptist church. There are hundreds of these churches scattered all across the country, and all of those First Baptists have something that make them special, something that make them important and unique. My name is Heath Lambert. I have the privilege of pastoring First Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida, one of those First Baptists, and a very special First Baptist Church. I think most leaders in the Southern Baptist Convention, America's largest Protestant denomination, would say that First Baptist Church in Jacksonville is on a very short list of some of the most significant of those churches. It was a profound role. People can identify Jerry Vines pretty quickly as one of the presidents of the SBC who served during the conservative resurgence and also as one of the people who provided leadership to the conservative resurgence while it was while it was transpiring. The Jacksonville Pastors Conference, although it didn't have that same proximity in time to the annual meeting, also played a similar role and I think in many ways was almost as important as the SBC Pastors Conference because it was an occasion where people would come in from all over the country and they would hear preaching from people who were aligned with the conservative resurgence and who were promoting the idea of the trustworthiness, the inerrancy, and the sufficiency of Scripture. 
So at that pastor's conference, anything like that that's a gathering was important. A short list of churches like First Baptist in Dallas and First Baptist Atlanta, other influential churches like Bellevue Baptist that doesn't have the name First Baptist, but still has much significance in the history of the Southern Baptist Convention. First Baptist Jacksonville is one of those great and influential and significant churches. It's actually a truly great church. Its greatness is seen in the fact that it reached tens of thousands of people in the 1980s. Its greatness is seen in the fact that it once was one of the 10 largest churches in the United States. Jimmy Scroggins is the pastor of Family Church in West Palm Beach, Florida. This is a portion of my conversation with him. So my connection with First Jacksonville runs pretty deep. So I grew up in Jacksonville, but not attending that church. But I was aware of that church because that church was such a huge presence in our city. And they were on television every Sunday, and I knew a lot of people who went there. Jacksonville, Florida is truly a city of many blessings. As the gateway to Florida and its first coast, it abounds with many natural resources that make it one of the most beautiful cities in our land. Its social, business, cultural, educational, and recreational opportunities make it a great place to live while attracting thousands of newcomers annually. Yes, Jacksonville is truly blessed of God. And in the heart of our city is found the miracle of downtown Jacksonville. People from all over Northeast Florida drive in to be a part of this exciting fellowship. As one of the largest churches in America, the First Baptist Church of Jacksonville is meeting the needs of thousands weekly. We invite you now to join Pastor Homer G. Lindsay Jr. What was that like when you show up on Sunday? Well, you had to come an hour and a half early if you wanted to see. Okay. For one thing, they had an overflow downstairs, but it was a wonderful experience because we were all packed in there, mm -hmm. like being with your family and all of them sitting on the couch with you and you yeah. loving up on one another. The Lindsay Auditorium was full. Yeah. And at that time, we were having the pastor's conferences and all, and when that came about, People couldn't find a place to sit. Yeah. And I was an usher, and that wasn't too much fun, trying to <laughs> usher in that building where people couldn't get a seat. Yeah. You know, I came all the way out here to be in this and can't get in. Its greatness is seen in its ministry influence with churches all across the country who, for years, traveled to Jacksonville to learn how to do ministry the way they did at First Baptist. I grew up as a boy in this state, born in Lakeland, Florida, went to high school in Pompano Beach, and uh, Jacksonville, and especially the First Baptist Church, was and is Mecca to a Baptist boy in the state of Florida. When I was a teenager, I was listening to and benefiting from the sermons preached from this pulpit, and it has been my honor to be here and once again to be here. Here is Dr. John Sullivan. He was the executive director treasurer of the Florida Baptist Convention for almost 30 years, one of the key leaders in Baptist life for a generation, and a staff pastor at First Baptist Church over the last few years. Here's what he had to say. So you weren't in Florida during the 70s as all that was heating up, but you were involved in the conservative resurgence. You just said yes. you were on the peace committee. Right. What, what leadership role did First Baptist take, did Lindsay and Vines take in pushing the uh, convention to return to its conservative roots? First Baptist Church of Jacksonville might have been, along with Bellevue and Adrian Rogers, the two churches that pushed us along. Now, it was Patterson and, and Paul Pressler who were leading. They, they were the upfront leaders, but they were supported by First Jacksonville and Bellevue. And as a result of that, the two churches involved in it were the two largest churches in the Southern Baptist Convention yeah. at that time. What, what did they do to push it along? The pastor's conference. Pastor's conference, okay. You could almost be sure that whoever preached the first night of the pastor's conference <laughs> was the 
newly elected president of the Southern that's Baptist. What I, that's what I've heard. I've heard that was sort of the nominating convention <laughs> exactly. for uh, the Southern Baptist and Convention. It wor- and it worked every time. Its greatness is seen in its remarkable leaders throughout its history, regularly having in its top spot some of the best pastors and preachers in the entire Southern Baptist Convention. What is going to make me holy, blameless, and beyond reproach? Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ. The greatness of First Baptist Church is seen in the countless missionaries and pastors that have been sent out all over the country and all over the world to bring change in Jesus' name. Its greatness is seen in its massive pastors conference from the 1980s and the 1990s that during the years of the conservative resurgence was the second largest gathering in the Southern Baptist annual calendar, second only to the Southern Baptist convention itself. I have never been more intimidated in all of my life than I have been tonight. Our church the First Baptist in Dallas is supposed to be the largest of our Southern Baptist congregations, but it is nothing like this. Our church looks like a little mission compared to this great congregation. Then after that, after being regurgitated on dry ground, He preached a citywide crusade in a city about the size of Jacksonville, Florida, city-state, Nineveh. He didn't have a building like this. He didn't have a, a loudspeaker and a microphone that I need very much tonight. He didn't have any of that. Jesus Christ is alive, and he'll come into your heart if you invite him, if you trust him. But you've got to be willing to follow him. Like most pastors, I come a lot of times pretty much beaten down, and I leave very lifted up. The Lord has used the pastor's conference for 18 years to uh, encourage me, strengthen me, and help me to go back to his congregation and serve him. The experience here was just amazing. The excitement of coming to church here, the amount of people, the programs, everything that First Baptist did was first rate. Yeah. They didn't leave anything on the table. I mean, from pastor's conference to church camps to the choir programs, I mean, it was just amazing. And of course, Dr. Lindsay was still here at that time, and he would uh, preach one service in the morning or at night, either they would rotate between he and Dr. Vines. And so you got the best of both worlds. I mean, the preaching was just phenomenal. They would occasionally bring in evangelists, not very often, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I, I am dearly remember Junior Hill, one of my favorites, yeah. and just remember every time the man came, the most simple explanation of the gospel, no fancy sermon, just tell a couple of stories and tell the gospel and the aisles would be flooded. Mm. I mean, just, I mean, literally, 40, 50, 60, 80, 100 people walking the aisles, giving their life to Christ. And so it was an exciting time. You know, I remember pastor's conference, uh, having to get here early. I remember being in the very back row of the auditorium, sitting in the stairwell because there were no more seats. Yeah. Just taking it all in, hearing the best preachers in America come here, I did my best to take off work that week or arrange my schedule where I could be here because I did not want to miss pastor's conference. First Baptist Jacksonville is a truly great and a truly remarkable church. But the greatness of First Baptist Church is not just found in how large and influential it was. The remarkable nature of First Baptist Church also is owing to its dramatic decline. A lot happens in five years, and the incremental changes that take place over five years happen suddenly for someone who's been away for five years and then suddenly is back. So what'd you notice? Uh, Church attendance was way down. Um, The main auditorium was looking pretty bare, particularly in the balcony section. In every church, you you have people that like to camp on their their pews, right? And it's 
Uh, maybe not the best behavior, but it's present in almost every church I've been to. And it used to be that way with almost every single pew in the church. Like you're talking the back row, top of the balcony, corner of the auditorium. People wanted that spot. And now, I mean, take it. Like <laughs> you sit up there, there's you, you wouldn't be within 50 feet of another human being. Mm. One of the ways that we noticed that I said that I grew up coming here to pastor's conference. We would come here and I have vivid memories of in the main auditorium having to sit on the stair. Kids had to sit on the stairs because the pews were where the adults were sitting and there were no empty seats in pews. And so after Dustin and I were coming here, I remember still pastor's conference Sunday morning, you'd have to get out of Sunday school early so that you could go over and have a seat. And then that was that's just one of the easiest ways to tell that things weren't the same was that it got easier and easier over the years pastor's conference to find a seat Mm -hmm. i know that's a silly thing but it's it was one another way that we noticed was that again we were in newlyweds all this time Mm -hmm. and first though we were in engaged couples class and there were probably 15 couples with us that were in the engaged couples class and it that declined it seemed like, it's funny, actually, it seemed like after we were in there, the class wasn't the same again, but that was in 2005. And it just kept getting smaller. And then they started combining engaged things with newlywed things, which didn't always work because it's a similar phase of life, but at the same time, very different yeah, because well, one's well, married and one's not. Yeah. So we noticed stuff like that, that, and then eventually the, there was just not any couples left in the engaged couples class. And we didn't understand why. So I come back in 2010. Um, and I was here for the opening of the big auditorium. We came okay. back from Panama city for that morning Did you? Okay. Um, to be here for that. But when I came back in 2010, a lot of my friends no longer were here, Yeah. but it was still, A pretty vibrant church. I mean, there was a lot of people still, but the facilities, the rooms, a lot of them were the same as when I left. Yeah. Same carpet, same wallpaper. Uh. You know, a little bit of change here or there. I think the staff was different. Okay. Not a bad staff. Mm -hmm. When people were here in 86, they were committed. Yeah. They were all in. And maybe in a detriment, maybe some too much, maybe. Mm -hmm. I mean, people have families. People need to realize that. So 2010 was just different. It was just different. It wasn't bad. It was different preaching a little bit. Not bad. Yeah. Just different. But there was this, I think there was a, a, a lack of a sense of excitement. You know, what God was going to do. Okay. You know, I don't think things were remarkable. By the time I came to First Baptist in 2016, people were leaving quicker than they were joining First Baptist during its glorious heyday. By 2018, the church had lost all of the growth it had experienced during the 1970s and the 1980s and the 1990s. The church had tens of millions of dollars in liabilities that it had no idea how to pay, and it was borrowing six figures each month just to make payroll. It was a truly remarkable decline. Then I became the senior pastor, and things got a lot worse. The expensive option is we say, okay, well, we don't want to do that. We don't want to buy trouble, so let's fix everything. So still six years, let's get to 2025 and see what things look like. Let's fix everything. That means in year one, this year, we spend $37 million. We spend $37 million, and then in year two, three, four, five, and six, we spend $7 million each year, which is what it would actually take to keep up all the property that we had fixed. If we do that, then over six years, we will spend $72 million. Listen, these these are catastrophic numbers. I'm just telling you, this money doesn't exist. And if it did exist, if somebody came up to me and said, hey, I got you, I'll give you $72 million. I would say, you know what, I'm gonna take the $72 million. Thank you very much. (laughs) And maybe this is an appropriate time just to let you know that we'll be happy to receive that at the the response time. But I would also say, please don't make me spend it on a million and a half square feet that we don't need. Please don't make me spend it on a problem that we're going to have in 2025 if we don't fix it now. 
please don't make me have to ask for $100 million in 2025 to get us to 2030. This is not the fix. That money does not exist. It's a terrible investment, and it's already harming our ability to do ministry. Massive problems required massive change. Change is excruciating. The massive changes that were required to give First Baptist a shot at having a future created an explosion of difficulty. The reality is, for about 20 years, uh, we've had compounding problems. They get a little bit bigger every year. And we have, if you'll pardon my saying so, for a couple of decades, kicked the can down the road and hope things would get better. And I want to let you know uh, that it is my intention to no longer kick the can down the road. But but to fix it, and to fix it in a big way, in a big way that's going to require your help. And I'm going to tell you about that on Sunday, September the 8th. It was a four-year transition of pain that was the most difficult and challenging season of my entire life. In that difficult season, I saw the ugliest behavior I have ever seen from surprising people. We went through some very difficult times. I mean, we went through a lot of sleepless nights. We had a lot of prayer together, you, I, deacons, trustees. But to me, the most difficult thing was to see people that I had respected as Christians behave in dark and divisive ways and then leave the church. And many of them leave without even acknowledging why or when you would try to talk to them to find out what the reason was, they never would really give you an honest answer. Mm -hmm. That was discouraging. It was dark. It was depressing to see so many people that had poured their lives into this church to leave the church, and many of them left because they believed someone that was telling them untruth. Mm. They did not hear the facts. They did not follow Matthew 18. They didn't go and talk to the people that they thought were sinning against them or you know, that they had a problem with, as the Bible tells us to do. So I think a lot of it was the culture that we live in today. When people hear something, they jump on a bandwagon, they begin to support it, and many times they're not even really sure of what they're supporting. I confronted sin and weakness in my own heart that stunned me. God is using the opposition to bludgeon my lusts to death. And they're not dead yet. I'm not being triumphalist here. I'm telling you, I'm I'm standing before you as a work in progress, still struggling. I addressed agony and brokenness in my own family as they endured the fallout of the pain of the change. One of the low points, there was a lot of low moments, but one of the low moments was my daughter. She's 14 now. Was she 12 when this happened or 13? I forget. But uh, we were walking just, it's at night. We're walking outside. We're holding hands and talking. And she's talking about these friends who aren't allowed to speak to her anymore. She got ghosted on the text threads and abandoned and when they were doing things. And um, I mean, this is my girl. Okay, so like... I'm kind of obsessed with this little girl. I mean, she's like the best ever. Um, And she collapsed onto my chest sobbing. We literally, it knocked me over. So we're like laying in the grass and she's crying into my chest. (laughs) She says, daddy, I have lost all of my friends because you're my dad. Mm. 
and I, that was another one of those. I really didn't think I could make it. I'm thinking, mm-hmm. God, what, what am I doing? I mean, she showed me a picture. She showed me a picture that she took with her friends, and she showed me how none of them are speaking to her anymore mm-hmm. because of all of this. Ultimately, I want you to know I encountered the devil himself. There were days when I was not sure if the church would survive. There were days when I was certain I would not survive. I'm looking on Facebook and I'm looking at emails and I'm going, uh, you were in the room. You know that's not what happened. It was the ugliest, darkest thing I've ever seen in my life. I thought it was going to kill me. Really, physically, thought I'd die. And it just kept happening, kept happening. But the Lord was kind. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus promises to build his church, and he has built First Baptist Church throughout all of its history, and he is building First Baptist Church today. In 2023, First Baptist Church is spiritually healthy. It's financially strong. We're preaching the good news. We're making disciples. We're impacting our community and our world. And we are growing numerically for the first time in 25 years. I really believe that we have been through the fire, and I believe there's a purifying that comes through that. And I honestly believe the Spirit of God in this place is as strong as it's ever been. I can feel it in the love that people have for each other, the smiles on their faces, the encouragement, the camaraderie, the working together. People are serving the Lord. People are joining in and working. People are excited. Worship is wonderful. We're in one service now. We've got a full choir back together. It is exciting. People are having to go back into the auditorium and get there early to get their seats, uh, which is what happened in the 90s. And so I know we went through some tough times, and they were some really tough times. But I'm telling you, we're starting to feel the glory Mm. again, and that's nothing but Jesus. Mm. And so I am really excited. We've made a lot of changes. We've got more changes to come. There's going to be more hurdles to come. But I'm telling you, we serve a God that's fully capable of taking us to where he wants us to be until he comes to take us home. In the great kindness of God, one of the most painful seasons in the history of our church and the most painful moment in my life is not one of loss and defeat, but God has turned it into a story of grace, of victory, of faithfulness, and of success. I was thinking of things that I've fallen in love with in my life, and in the top three or four is First Baptist Church. And I don't mean the buildings and the facilities we have here, but the people that are here. They have our heart, we love them, We love the people in this church. We love all of them. And God's laying out a way here, it looks like to me, to keep us together and to uh, take us back to a time when we could love one another more as we love Christ together and serve Him through this church. Thank you, Jesus. I am thankful to the Lord for this, and I want to tell you the story of what happened. 